Uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. I am Kelly Phillips. I am the program director here at TechNX. We are a not for profit association currently in our 41st year of operation. And as an association, we're focused on being a support community for businesses within the tech industry. TechNX is the leader in peer to peer programming, running a series of peer groups every month with a strong focus on personal, professional, and business growth. Our sessions are where people can connect with other business leaders, share best practices and business insights, learn from others who might have or are experiencing similar challenges and grow your business. So please reach out to myself um, if you're interested in joining any of our peer groups and you'll have my information because I have sent everything out to you. Uh, with more people working from home and small businesses moving to a hybrid or fully remote operating model, it can be difficult for individuals and small businesses to keep up with ensuring all aspects of their personal and professional or business information is safe and secure. Cyber attacks are occurring more frequently and cyber criminals are becoming more sophisticated and always looking for new ways to steal your private and confidential information. With over 25 years experience, we welcome Victoria Arkhurst, the Virtual Chief Information Security Officer at IRM Consulting and Advisory, a boutique cybersecurity consulting and advisory firm obsessed with implementing security best practices by taking a consultative approach to every client engagement. And before I turn things over to Victoria so that everybody knows, feel free, we're going to do, Victoria's going to do this into two sections, one on personal personal side, individual side, and then on small business side of things. And we'll take a break for any questions. If you do have questions, throw them in the chat and then we will allow you at the same time. If you have questions, we'll open it up and please come off and, um, and ask your question. With that, Victoria, I'm going to turn things over to you. And Victoria is going to lead her, leave her slides as such, because you can still see them and this way she can she can navigate. You know, when you, you start doing things on multiple screens, it, it makes it a little bit difficult. So welcome everybody. Victoria, I'll turn things over to you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. I uh, appreciate that. Okay, so just to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Victoria Arkhurst, uh, founder of IRM Consultant Advisory. Um, I have over 24, so 20 years experience in cybersecurity information and operational risk management, primarily in the financial services industry. So IRM is a company, uh, we are a cybersecurity consultant firm. We provide cybersecurity consultant services to small companies. Uh, we help small companies protect their information assets and achieve information security industry certifications such as ISO 27001 to improve their security posture and maturity. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, so for today's Launch and Learn, uh, I'll be covering cybersecurity best practices for individuals and small businesses. Uh, so the first part of this presentation, I'm gonna walk you through cybersecurity best practices for individuals and also cover some resources and free tools you can use as individuals uh, to stay safe. And the second part of the presentation will be covering cybersecurity best practices for small businesses and also I will cover resources and free tools to help small businesses keep safe. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So as individuals, we need to get cyber safe. Um, so what is Get Cyber Safe? Um, get, get Cyber Safe is, is a national public awareness campaign in Canada created to inform Canadians about cybersecurity and the simple steps that they can take to protect themselves online. Right? So how do we stay safe? How do we protect our personal information assets that is very valuable to us? And what are the best practices to get cyber safe as an individual? So as individuals, we have computers and laptops, workstations at home, right? Uh, we have mobile devices, which are phones, tablets, and other Bluetooth devices like speakers. Um, we all have a, a home network. Uh, we have a router at home that provides us with our Wi-Fi network. And we also have smart home devices. We have smart TVs, smart appliances, cameras, wireless home security, gaming systems, and other smart devices that connect to our home Wi-Fi network. So we have to bear all this in mind and you know, consider keeping safe uh, with all these devices 
connected to our home network. I'm going to move on to the next slide. So trying to get cyber safe as an individual, these are the six key areas to consider to get cyber safe, right? You need to look at the endpoint devices you have in your home, which is your workstations, your computers, your mobile phones, any other devices you may have, and look at the security of those devices and ensure that you've configured them securely. The next thing you need to look at is, you know, you browse the internet, obviously, on a daily basis, everyone does. Looking at the security of the internet and the security of when we're browsing, how we browse the internet. Uh, email, we all send personal emails, work emails. Um, so on a personal basis, as from an individual basis, you know, what are the security best practices that we need to bear in mind when we're communicating by email? Your home network, most importantly, you know, your home network is the communication point to the public network. Uh, you have all these devices in your home connected to your home network. So what are the best practices that one must implement to ensure that the home Wi-Fi network is secure? Uh, the next area to consider is identity and access security. So protecting your identity and ensuring that access to any of your personal information is protected. Um, one last key area to consider is also where you store your files and folders and ensure that wherever you're storing your files and folders, personal information is adequately protected. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. So let's start with uh, the endpoint device security. Your computers, laptops and mobile devices at home store a huge amount of information about you. So you need to make sure you know how to use them safely and keep your data secure. So some of the risks that we face as individuals, I've tried to highlight them, uh, is unauthorized access to, to your device. So someone trying to gain access to your, your laptop or your computer that you use for your personal um, activities. Misconfiguration of your device, um, not configuring your device adequately from a security perspective or not even configuring it at all. Um, so that's a risk that you know, individuals we face. Um, using your device to communicate over unsecure networks um, is another risk we face. Um, you know, we may walk into our Starbucks, um, have a coffee and decide to you know, communicate on the network. Um, we have to be careful to make sure our communication is not you know, being done over unsecure Wi-Fi connections. And hacking, we're all susceptible to, to, to being hacked as individuals, right? The risk of being hacked, hack, being hacked is quite high, given that we're all working remotely and, um, you, know, uh, you know, these hackers, again, they're sophisticated and they know how to trick us very easily. So uh, everyone is at risk of being hacked uh, at some point. So we need to make sure that we implement the correct best practices to protect ourselves. Uh, on the right hand side, I've kind of listed out some of the best practices you may consider to protect your endpoint device. Always enable disk encryption. Um, so the majority of people will be using a Windows or a Mac book, right? Um, so Windows operating systems and the Mac OS provide encryption capabilities. So make sure that you've enabled those to ensure the data that you're storing on that device is encrypted. And also ensure you install antivirus and anti-malware software. I have a lot of friends who use um, uh, the MacBook, and for some strange reason, you know, a lot of people think because I'm using a MacBook, there's no way I can get hacked. This is a Mac, right? It's secure. Um, I'm sorry, that's not the case, right? Uh, regardless of whether you're using Windows or Mac, always ensure you have some kind of antivirus, anti-malware software installed. Keep your software and operating system up to date. Um, you know, majority of the time, you know. Um, you know, software vendors provide automatic updates. I uh, certainly know on my MacBook, um, I have automatic updates enabled. There's a feature to enable automatic updates. So I don't have to keep remembering to keep my software updates updated all the time. It's very important to keep your software up to date because every time software vendors push out new releases or patches, um, they update the software. So if you don't update your software and operating systems, you're basically not applying patches or uh, mitigating uh, vulnerable, vulnerable software that could exist in your operating system. So it's very important to keep your software up to date. Install a private VPN and turn, off, turn on your firewall. So on your Windows and your MacBooks, there is a feature and functionality to turn on firewalls um, on, your, on your actual device. Uh, by turning on a firewall, it prevents any un, in, unwanted traffic uh, access in your actual device. So 
if the feature is not, if you have that feature and capability with Windows and your, your Mac OS, uh, make sure that it's turned on. And also install a private VPN on your device. So when you're communicating on the internet, it's communicating through a secure channel as opposed to going directly to the internet. Always turn off Bluetooth and Wi-Fi if not in use. Um, enable two-factor authentication. So uh, what 2FA is essentially, uh, when we do log on to systems, websites, we typically will put our usernames, our passwords in there, right? Uh, so that's one factor authentication. The password's authenticating you or verifying you. But um, by using a second factor authentication, like an authentication app or a fingerprint or face ID uh, or any form of biometric, as a second factor authentication, it's, it's, it's more secure and more safer uh, because if your password gets compromised and a hacker tries to log in with your credentials, if you have two factor authentication, there's no way they can basically um, authenticate themselves because of that second factor. They either need your face ID, they need your fingerprint, or they need the code that has been generated from your authentication app. So your device ensure that you enable to uh, multi-factor authentication if your device supports it. Only download apps from trusted devices, never download apps from uh, sources that you're not familiar with. Um, as I mentioned earlier, avoid using unsecure Wi-Fi networks if you can. Um, enable security settings and lock your device and obviously back up your data. Um, so these are kind of some of the security best practices you may want to implement and consider uh, to protect the security of your endpoint devices. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Another area to consider as an individual um, is, you know, your security as you're browsing the internet, right? So we all use one form of a browser, whether it's Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Edge. Uh, we use some kind of a browser to interact with the internet. So the best practices to um, basically implement is to keep your browser software up to date. Always keep your browser software up to date. Turn on auto updates. Uh, most browsers are semi no. Chrome and Firefox come with um, a feature to um, turn on automatic updates. So every time Chrome releases a new update of their software or Firefox releases a new update, you know, your browser software is automatically updated. You don't need to, need to remember to do that. When you're browsing on the internet, especially if you go online shopping, um, try and use a private window. Don't use the normal window that's presented by your browser. If you look in your browser, uh, your file menu, there's an option to select private window for Firefox. And if I think if you're using Chrome, there's an option to um, launch your, your, your basically your page using incognito. And this is basically giving you a private window. Um, so by using a private window to browse the internet, you, you know, you're not trapped, your interactions and your activities that you perform yes, on the internet are not trapped and no one follows you. So I typically... I typically use a private window when I decide to go online shopping on Amazon or to buy stuff. Uh, because I'm going in there, I'm putting my personal information uh, into these websites. Um, I'm providing these websites with my credit card information, right? So it's very important to uh, ensure you're using a private window when online shopping. Manage and disable unnecessary plugins, add ons, and extensions in your browser. So typically, browser software comes with, you know, um, installed add-ons, extensions. And what these are, these plugins, add-ons, and extensions, essentially are software that run within your browser itself, right? And some of these add-ons and extensions can be malicious, right? So always make sure you check your browser settings. Uh, go into um, your settings and look at all the um plugins and add-ons that have been installed within your browser and delete any unnecessary um, log, you know, add-ons and plugins you do not need, right? Only use the plugins and add-ons you need uh, because a lot, a lot of malicious software is basically built into these plugins. Always connect to HTTPS sites. Um, you know, when you're going onto a website, always make sure it's prefixed with a HTTPS um, prefix or has a padlock icon. Um, always clear your browser cache and history after you finish surfing the internet uh, before you shut down your computer. Because the majority of the time when you go onto websites, they place, especially when you have to you know, put in your username, password, and some personal information, they, they capture this information and place it into a cookie, which is basically a file on your, on your, your device. 
And cookies can contain you know, passwords and confidential information. And so if you are hacked, and the first thing a hacker would do is go and look for cookies that store your passwords and confidential information, and they can use that to steal your, your personal information. So always make sure that you're clearing your browser cache and your history. Never store passwords in your browser. Um, nearly all modern web browsers today and many websites today enable this feature, allowing you to store your passwords uh, in the browser. Try not to do that. Disable this feature if you have it enabled and use a password manager tool instead. And obviously with browsers, uh, we have, browsers come with security configuration. Majority of people are not aware of it. Um, because you know the browser is free, you go download it and off you go surfing, people don't think about uh, security settings. So browsers come with security configuration that could help make you safe and reduce the risk of malware infections and malicious attacks. So always look at your browser security settings and make sure it's configured adequately. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Email security. All right, so social engineering tactics by email is a key attack vector for hackers. So we've provided um, some recommendations to help reduce the exposure to these threats. Now, everyone is at risk of phishing. Uh, I get it every day. Everyone is at risk of malware being um, installed on their, their computers. So we have to find ways of mitigating these risks, right? So some of the best practices you could consider is to ensure that you're using two-factor authentication when you're logging onto your email accounts, right? So it's not just your device, you have two-factor authentication to log onto your device to protect yourself, but also when you're logging to your email account, whether it's Google Mail or Microsoft Outlook, ensure you've enabled two-factor authentication as well um, to prevent any reuse of any compromised passwords. Always use secure um, email protocols, um, typically most, um, Email clients come with uh, secure transport layers uh, and secure protocols to use, um, but always check to make sure that your email client is configured to use uh, secure protocols to communicate by email. Email attachments. Um, yeah, avoiding opening email attachments or links from unsolicited emails. Always check the identity of the sender. Um, and this is where people become victims of phishing, right? And uh, because you don't check the identity of the vet of the sender, um, we automatically go in and open an attachment or click a link because we've been asked to click a link. Um, and this is where attackers, uh, you know, a lot of people can fall uh, and become victim to attackers. Um, so never open attachments, always check your email. If you're going to open attachments, make sure that, you know, you, you, you basically, you, you know, you can verify the, the sender and, you know, you know who sent, sent you that attachment. Um, again, phishing, as I mentioned, never open, you know, emails that, you know, are claiming, you know, things that are too good to be true. Um, always use email functionality to report block, uh, block junk mail or phishing email. So I use Microsoft Outlook and I know Google Mail also provides this feature. If you receive an email, um, you know, you verify the sender, you're not sure what email is about and you think it, how you're suspicious, it's a sufficient email. Microsoft or Google gives you the capability to report uh, or block that particular email address and you can report it as phishing so it does not appear on your inbox again. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide, um, which is about your home network security. Okay, we all have, we all work from home, um, even without working from home, we all have a home network uh, to some extent. Your home, work, home network connects a lot of devices. It connects your routers, your computers, your smartphones, Wi-Fi enabled baby monitors, cameras, and any other uh, Wi-Fi devices you may have. So one of the things you could do to ensure your home network is secure is to check the router configuration uh, of your router. Um, always change the default settings that come with your router. So if your internet service provider has provided you with a router, whether it's Rogers or Bell or someone else, <clears throat> always make sure that the SSID, which is the name of the router, is changed to something that's not so obvious. Uh, make sure you change the default uh, password that comes with the router. And some routers also provide you with the capability to log on to an administrative portal uh, where you can basically configure and manage your router by yourself, right? Um, and these portals tend to come with a password to allow you to get into the portal. So make sure you change the default password of those uh, devices that provide you with administrative portals. 
Additional things you can do to utilize, uh, to you know, increase this uh, security of your home network is to um, install a network firewall and a private VPN. Um, a network firewall will block suspicious traffic from entering your home network and a private VPN provides uh, secure communications between your home network and the wider internet world, right? Um, your Wi-Fi network at home, make sure that your Wi-Fi network at home is using secure protocols. So you can check to ensure that you're using WPA2 or WPA3, which is essentially secure Wi-Fi protocols. If you're using anything on the, other than WPA2 or WPA3, more than likely your home Wi-Fi network is not secure. And you're, you're at risk of you know, potentially um, being, you know, being hacked. Um, some routers uh, at home provide the ability to remote into those routers. So if you have a router at home that you're using for your home network and it has the capability to remote into remotely log on to the router, make sure you disable that feature. Um, it's important because uh, you don't want any unauthorized individuals trying to access your home network. Your router also comes with firmware, software, which is software in hardware, essentially. Uh, make sure that your router is, has got automatic updates enabled and automatically updates your firmware software to keep, uh, keep your software up to date. Um, so that's quite important. I think majority of routers do do that, but you know, some people may have older routers uh, in their homes for the home network that not, don't necessarily have this feature. Uh, so make sure that uh, you do check and enable that. Um, if you are going away, uh, you're going to be away from home for a long period of time, make sure that you turn your router off. It's important. Um, you don't want to keep your home network wide open um, if you're not utilizing it or you're going to be away from home for a long period of time. Um, the last but not least is vulnerability scanning. Um, there are free tools out there that you could install um, to scan your home network and it will scan and discover any connected devices on your home network. Um, a lot of people don't realize the number of devices connected to their network, um, or it could be a case of unauthorized devices connecting to your home network, right? So, you know, implementing and installing a vulnerability scanning tool, it will help discover what's connected, you know, in my home network. Do I, do I know what these, these devices are? And if I don't identify or cannot identify any of these devices, more than likely, someone has managed to get into your home network in, you know, um, on an authorized manner, and therefore you need to de and delete those devices you do not recognize. So it's very important to run a vulnerability scanning tool on your home network to understand what devices are connected to your home network. Okay, I'll move on to the next slide. <clears throat> Identity and access management. Now, the frequency of data breaches in organizations today has increased about 20%. And the amount of security breaches in Canada still rises year on year today. And I've provided some examples here. Um, so one example is life, life lapse. Um, a couple of years ago, hackers stole personal health information belonging to 15 million Canadians. Uh, I certainly personally, I've used life, 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 life lives before for blood tests, and I know they have my you know, personal health information. So I know you know, my information has been exposed to hackers because life, life, life labs got breached, right? So another example is uh, there was a data breach at Bell that exposed a lot of customer personal information to hackers. And we also had another breach at the Home Depot where customer data was breached due to a system error. Now, as individuals, we unfortunately have no control over these security events and we rely on organizations who store and process our personal information and health information. We rely on them to keep that information safe, right? And as, as individuals, we need to find out, or how can we find out if our personal information has been breached and, and what do we do about it? So what I've done uh, here is I've provided a, a website called Have I Been Pawned? And what this website does is uh, it can tell you if you have been a victim of a data breach. So you can go into the website, enter in your email address, and it basically goes away, it does a scan and generates a report and output for you. And it will tell you if your email address has been breached, right? And I remember I did that when Bell had a, a, that data breach, I went into, have I been pawned? And I checked my email address and lo and behold, yes, I was breached. I did see that my email address was breached because of the Bell hack, 
of what the bell hack, right? So, you know, it's a good place to go to find out if your email address has been breached. Another place to, you can, another uh, kind of website you can use to check whether you've been hacked is a website called nodpass.com. Uh, it's a subscription um, and you can go in and check to, you know, if you want to check whether you've been hacked or not, that's a good place to go. Majority of people who have been hacked don't realize they've been hacked, right? Uh, they carry on with their normal day-to-day -day lives. And in the meantime, they've got malicious software running on their devices. The hackers, you know, following them around. The hacker knows exactly what you're doing, where you're going, which websites you're going to. Um, so it's important to check whether you've been hacked or not. Um, so I provided that, you know, email, that uh, website as a, as a reference point. And if you have been hacked or you have been a victim of a, a data breach, what do you do? Um, one of the initial reactions, we always, initial kind of reactions, uh, you know, we always advise on is to change your passwords immediately. Um, especially if you're not using two-factor authentic authentication. If you're using two-factor two authentication, you're probably a bit safer, but I would go ahead and change the password anyway. So change your password first and foremost. Um, and, and change the password for the, for the email addresses that have been breached. And, you know, if you're really paranoid and think, well, I still don't feel safe, we can always change your email address altogether. Start using a brand new email address for your interactions on email. Uh, also check on your online banking and other financial accounts you may have, and other online accounts you may have using that email address that was breached. Uh, you want to make sure you change your passwords on your online banking. And again, as I mentioned, you can altogether change, change your email address altogether as well to, uh, to feel protected. And also scan your computer for viruses and malware. So if you've been a victim of a data breach or if you found out that you've been hacked, um, try and um, run a scan on your computer to ensure there's no malicious code running on your computer. Okay, um, the next part is um, sharing files and folders and access to your files and folders. So uh, Windows operating system, Mac OS uh, devices provide capability to share um, resources on your computer. You can share files and folders. You can even share your printer, allow someone to print uh, their documents using your printer. Uh, you can share all kinds of resources on your computer. So, you know, always make sure by default sharing is turned off. Um, and if you do need to share, um, files and folders, make sure you are sharing it with individuals that you know, okay? Um, Microsoft OneDrive Personal Vault is a tool that Microsoft provides. And essentially, Personal Vault is a protected area on OneDrive where you can store your most important and sensitive files and keep them safe. So that's another option. Uh, if you feel you're handling or you, know, you have personal information, sensitive information on your device and you don't feel secure about it, you can uh, basically use a tool like Microsoft's OneDrive Personal Vault uh, to protect sensitive information. Okay. Um, so the last but not least, storage files and folders. So yeah, we use our computers at home. Um, we have to make sure we're backing up our files to protect ourselves. Uh, because if someone hacks your computer and your computer cannot work anymore, or you cannot access it anymore, at least you know your data is back up, backed up and you can recover it. So make sure that you always back up your files and folders, protect your sensitive information. And there are different options for backups, right? One could choose to copy the data on the device onto a cloud storage, like a OneDrive or a Google Drive. That's one method of backing up your data. And if you choose to back up your data into a cloud storage, always make sure that you review the privacy policies and security features offered by the cloud provider, because you want to make sure that, you know, your data is going to be safe um, by storing it in their environment. Uh, another option uh, for backups is to purchase an external hard drive or a portable disk, or you could use a USB um, stick. Um, connect that to your computer and you can copy your important files onto those devices. Um, on your actual device, you know, there is a capability to set up um, a backup schedule. So, for example, I use my Mac OS and uh, Mac OS comes with a software called Time Machine and that automatically backs my uh, Mac on a daily basis. I don't have to worry about backing up, backing up on a daily basis or scheduling backups. If you set up your automatic backup schedule on your device, uh, you can be sure that your, uh, your device will be backed up on a daily basis. And also protect your backups, uh, if, especially if you're backing it up onto an external drive or a portable disk. 
make sure that driver portable disk is encrypted and uh, is password protected as well. Okay, move on to the last slide. So this slide, uh, basically uh, what I've done is I've provided some useful resources and free tools that you can use as individuals to help keep you cyber safe, right? So there is a website for Get Cyber Safe. Um, in that website, on that website, there is a, a simple cybersecurity questionnaire or a checklist for individuals to use. You can go in and go through that questionnaire to check and test yourself to ensure that you, know, you are keeping yourself safe. Uh, so I recommend that, take that questionnaire if you can. And also um, there are all other additional resources on the uh, Cyber, Cyber Safe website, uh, the latest videos, infographs, shareable content uh, to educate and help individuals to stay uh, safe online. Uh, another resource that you may want to consider is a tool called uh, Trend Micro. Um, Trend Micro is a software, a security software company, and they provide a free vulnerability assessment tool. Uh, I personally use this tool for my home network and uh, I use it to scan my home network and basically it will discover and clean up any of my home devices. It also will tell me uh, if there are any security vulnerabilities on the devices I'm utilizing at home. So, you know, I recommend you try and download this free tool. It's, it's very good. Uh, another tool you may want to consider uh, using is called Ghostery uh, to help you browse and browse the internet in a safe in a safe manner. So it provides safe internet browsing basically. So Ghostery blocks trackers, ads, pop-ups, you know, stops ads and, tr and trackers from accessing your personal information. Um, so if you want, don't want to be followed, uh, if you don't want to be tracked on the internet uh, as you're browsing, uh, Ghostery is a good tool to stop uh, that tracking and following. DuckDuckGo. So DuckDuckGo is a new internet search engine and it protects the privacy, your privacy on the internet. Uh, so most people go to Google or Bing uh, to search on the internet, uh, but you are, you are being followed. Google follows you. Um, and Google you know, knows where you're going, what you're doing, where you've shopped. And you know, if you find that that's too intrusive, um, I recommend using DuckDuckGo because uh, no one follows you. Your information is kept private. Uh, whatever you're searching on, on the internet is not exposed to anyone else. So uh, DuckDuckGo is a very good search, search, engine, uh, search engine for privacy protection. Um, last but not least, um, LastPass. LastPass is a free password manager tool. Um, it helps generate complex uh, passwords. It helps store and keep your passwords safe and secure. And automatically also fills in um, forms for you. So for example, if you're storing your password, passwords and LastPass, if you do go onto a website where you have to enter your credentials, you know, LastPass has already stored your credentials and passwords. So it's a case of, you know, it automatically filling that information for you without you having to type it in. Also, one good advantage of using a password manager is you don't have to remember all the different passwords you have, right? We all have so many accounts, so many passwords, it's so difficult to remember. And because of that, we tend to create very simple passwords because, you know, it's so difficult to remember a complex password. So LastPass is very good. It generates complex password, it's passwords for you, it stores it for you, and you never have to remember these uh, passwords. You just use them as and when you log on to websites, right? So that's one recommendation I would make uh, to help um, keep yourself safe and secure. So that comes brings me to the end of the first section of this presentation uh, about individuals. So um, I'll pause here for any questions. Victoria, I, I'm going to ask a, a question here because you even talked about, you know, turning your router off and I never thought of that. I shut the water off in the house so you don't have a flood, but you talked about shutting the router off. We have so many devices connected here that um, control our lights and control um, my security system, control everything. Does that affect that? that yes, it would. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's a very good question, actually, because, you know, one of the recommendations uh, cybersecurity professionals um, provide is if you're going to have, it's great to have a home network, but you're going to have, if you're going to have a security system and other systems that are connecting to your home network, the recommendation is to have a separate router. Right. Okay. So have a separate router for your normal day-to-day -day internet browsing and have a separate router for any security systems 
and any other systems that you have on your in your home, right? So that way you can leave that on and your, your home's been monitored and you're safe, but you can turn off the other router uh, that you use to surf the internet, basically, right? So that's one recommendation I would give. But yeah, if you do turn your, your router off and you're using a router for your security system, then obviously that's not a good idea, right? When you're going to work on. So no, I would not recommend that. But yeah, the recommendation is to buy two routers, let one control your security system and the other for your day-to-day -day, um, internet activities. Okay. Now, this is a question kind of on that. Um, we have, like, what if you have a password? The password at our house is so complex that it takes about half an hour to enter enter it, and which is good because my husband set that up. If you have something like that, are you okay? Like, I think our password is, I'm not giving it away, but it's like 20 to 25 characters and it's like uppercase it's lowercase it's this it's that it's like it's everything and it's so complex yeah is that more acceptable if you're not going to have two two routers i guess it would yeah having complex passwords is always a good thing it's always a good thing but one thing about you know setting up complex password is passwords is, is very tedious because you've got to remember right you've got to remember uppercase lowercase special characters and it's, it's very long string password so that's why I was recommending maybe using a, a password manager like LastPass. Uh, you don't have to remember the complex password. It stores it for you. Actually, it generates complex passwords and it stores it for you. So you never have to remember it. And when you're ready to use it, it basically um, enters the password for you when you go to log on to websites uh, or whatever the case may be. Right. Okay. So you may want to consider um, looking into LastPass as an option for you. Okay. Brad, you've got a question. Hi, everyone. Uh, Victoria, thank you so much for such an amazing, insightful session. I have a question just on the password uh, uh, part of things. Apple has a, um, the iPhone has a similar service where they, it auto-generates passwords for you and so on and so forth. What's your take on their security? <laughs> like, should we be using that that feature that's available through Apple or would you recommend staying away from it? No, I would use it. I mean, Apple, Prima, compared to your know, Android phones, Apple phones are fairly secure, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I certainly would use it. Um, you know, there's a reason why Apple's provided that. Um, so, yeah, I definitely would take advantage of that. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. The, the, the big concern for me is so the browser uh, passwords. Quite frankly, I've got a bunch of them stored there. So, yeah. uh, and all on Google, like the Google browser is the only browser that I use. The Chrome browser. So right. I've got a bunch of passwords there. So your recommendation is don't use the password uh, yeah. saving feature from, from that. Yeah. yeah, don't try not to store your, your passwords in browser. Use a password manager like LastPass. Okay, okay, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you, just uh, Victoria, again for such a wonderful session. And Kelly and Ryan, thank you so much for putting this together. This was a very, very good session. No problem. There's still another half there, Brad. So we're we're, okay. we're good. We'll move on. But uh, yeah, I do want to ask one other quick question. And this is you talked about private windows and going through when you're going to like shop or, or whatever. Um, so you're saying that when I open up my, my iPhone or my iPad and I have 20 tabs open because I want to remember, oh, yeah, this recipe that I looked up or this, that's probably a really bad idea. I would recommend using private window if you're going to shop online, okay. right? I mean, you can use a normal browser to go check out restaurants, do whatever you need to do. But if you're going to be using sensitive information, like putting your credit card information onto a website or, or, or logging into your online banking, yeah, my recommendation is to use a private window. Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right. So then I'll let you move on to the next okay. next half. And then if anybody has other questions that you think of as Victoria progresses, throw it in the chat and we can we'll make sure that we get to it at the end. OK, so I'll move on to the next uh, part of the presentation. So um, on this second part, I'll be covering baseline security controls that small businesses must implement to stay safe. So we're going to look at Cyber Secure Canada baseline controls. So what is Cybersecure Canada? Cybersecure Canada is the nation's cybersecurity certification program for small and medium-sized organizations. By implementing Cybersecure Canada baseline controls as a small business, you'll be taking steps to improve your organization's cybersecurity posture. 
By implementing these baseline controls, you will one, limit the impact of any cybersecurity incidents. Two, you will enhance your competitive advantage and attract new business. Three, you will build trust and reassure your customers and investors that the information that you hold about them is going to be protected. And last but not least, you're going to improve your cybersecurity knowledge and culture within your organizations. So by implementing these baseline controls, you can achieve cybersecurity Canada certification for your business, right? So this is something that's been offered by the government um, for, to small businesses. It's not mandatory right now, it's voluntary. But if you want to gain a competitive advantage, um, if you want to assure your customers, potential investors that, you, you know, you are running a safe environment, having a cyber secure Canada certification is very good for you as a small business. It's a good step to protect yourself. So uh, let's go through these controls. So one of the controls, baseline controls, is securely configured devices. So we talked about that from an ind individual perspective. The same would apply. Uh, if you're a small business, right? You know, you, you're purchasing all kinds of devices, routers, laptops, mobile phones. I always make sure that you securely configure them, you know, change the administrative passwords that come with those devices, um, disable all unnecessary functionality on that device if you don't need to use that functionality, and always ensure that you enable the necessary security features that come with uh, these devices. Um, you know, as a small organizations, you know, you may or may not have an IT team, but if you have an IT team, uh, refer to, you know, consult your IT team to make sure that all your devices are securely configured. And if you are utilizing an IT service provider, you may want to engage them and contact them to ensure that um, all your devices are implemented with, you know, baseline security controls. And the second control to have in place is to use strong user authentication. So, you know, we talked about two-factor authentication, right? The same would apply in a business environment. You know, um, gone are the days of just username and password. We all should start thinking about having a second factor to verify and, you know, uh, verify users before they are authenticated into our network environment. So uh, there are various forms of two-factor authentication. You can use a, an authentication app that generates a, a unique code, or you can use a biometric a face ID or fingerprint uh, on your device. Uh, so, for example, I use a Mac, and on my Mac, it comes with a, a fingerprint uh, on my keyboard. It's a button for a fingerprint. So every time I log into my Mac, it, it requires me to uh, place my finger on the fingerprint button um, before it actually allows me to log on to my uh, device. So um, the next uh, control to consider is access control and authorization. So um, always follow the principle of least privilege. And what that means is only give employees access to information and resources on a need to know basis. So if employee does not need access to a specific folder or file, there's no need to get them access, right? So that's the principle of least privilege, only giving access on a need to know basis, right? Um, if you, obviously you have administrative accounts as an organization, um, ensure that all administrative accounts are restricted to only authorized employees. And typically this will be your IT team, uh, or if you're using a service provider, it will be that service provider. But ensure that your administrative accounts are not made available to all employees and only restricted to authorized employees. Always give your users unique individual accounts. Um, never you know, have uh, shared passwords or shared accounts. Uh, by having a shared account, that means you're sharing a password, right? So always make sure for accountability, um, always make sure users are given unique individual IDs to log in. Implement a process to revoke accounts, right? So employees leave the firm, they join the firm. So have a process and document a process for your onboarding and your offboarding. So document how you onboard employees, document how you offboard employees. Um, so when employees are being onboarded, um, you know you have to create an account and give them access to resources. So by applying the least privileged principle, you know, okay, this employee is joining, they're going to be working in the you know, finance department, so they only need access to finance systems, or they're going to be working in the marketing department, so they only need access to marketing systems. Um, and make sure also you document your offboarding process, so when employees leave uh, your organization, uh, you revoke their accounts and any access to resources in a timely manner. Okay. 
Uh, move on to the next slide. Okay. So um, additional baseline controls to consider as a small business, an incident response plan. Small businesses typically, you know, uh, think oh, I'm too small. You know, well, what would a hacker want with me anyway? I you know, don't have anything that a hacker would need. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not the case, right? Uh, have an incident response plan. An incident response plan allows you to detail who is responsible for handling cyber incidents and what you would do in the event that you do have a cyber incident, right? If you need assistance and help with documenting uh, an incident response plan, you can engage an external cybersecurity consultant firm like IRM, and we will help you to develop an incident response plan. Having an incident response plan makes you prepared. You're prepared for any potential cyber attack or incident that may occur in your environment, and you will be able to respond quite effectively and in a timely manner to reduce uh, any potential impact it may have on your organization. The next uh, baseline control is patching your operating systems and applications. This is a huge area. And in my kind of 20, over 20 years working in cybersecurity, patching has always been an issue, right? For some reason, we're not very good at patching. It doesn't matter how big the organization is. I've worked in big banks, small companies, medium companies. Patching is always a challenge. Um, we always use software, operating systems are software, applications are all software, and software is vulnerable. Um, you know, so always make sure that you enable automatic updates for your operating system. Um, so for example, I use my Mac OS, um, I enable automatic updates. So every time Apple releases a new version or uh, releases a patch for the Mac OS operating system, I get notification, I just click a button and I get my automatic update. So, so um, in order to manage patch, manage your, your, your software vulnerabilities and patch in a timely manner, the recommendation is to implement a vulnerability and patch management tools and process. And again, if you need any assistance in doing that, I mean, IRM can help you do that. So by doing that, you're, you're basically continuously scanning your environment for vulnerable software. And when these tools identify the vulnerable software, they actually do give you guidance on how to mitigate these vulnerabilities or how to patch these vulnerabilities, right? So, and ensure that you're patching in a timely manner. You're not patching maybe a month later or two months later, right? So every, every time you identify a vulnerability, especially if it's a high risk vulnerability, you wanna make sure you're patching immediately to keep your um, software safe. Um, the next, uh, Kind of the baseline control is security software and data loss prevention, right? So you want to make sure you're protecting your organization's information assets against any threats, any threats posed by known malware, viruses, so on and so forth. So you know having antivirus um, installed is, is a good start, but also you want to consider data loss prevention solutions that are out there. Um, so as a small business, I can give an example. Let's assume you're, you're a small startup, you're building uh, a product. Uh, it's a web application product, right? Um, you've got a bunch of developers working hard and building your, your, your product for you. And one of the developers decides you know, to move on onto another organization. Well, does the, you know, the code that the developers are using to build your product is your proprietary code, right? Uh, so there's a risk that a developer could copy your code and take it elsewhere, right, to another organization or use it for their own personal purposes. So you want to consider, you know, implementing um, software that helps uh, prevent data loss, right? And there are tools out there that will help you do that. Also, um, tools like this can, you know, basically detect if someone's trying to copy, you know, sensitive information or proprietary information to a USB stick, as an example. Um, it can prevent uh, employees from copying company information to any external sources. Um, so it's, it's very, uh, these tools are very good. And uh, I do recommend as a small business, uh, especially if your business is, uh, is a, it has a huge development shop and your proprietary code is, uh, you know, your, your proprietary code uh, needs to be protected because you are, you know, providing a web application as your product. Um, you want to make sure that there's no loss to your data. Okay, I'll move on to the next set of best practices. Backing up, so again, similar to individuals, no difference uh, for small companies, as a company is even more important to back up your data uh, because loss of your data pretty much ends your company, right? Um, so as a company, always try and identify what information is critical to 
your the function of your your organizations right so uh, make sure you back up all essential and critical business information on a regular basis and your backups are stored in in an external location right so the best way to protect against potential disruption uh, that could occur in your business uh, whether it's a cybersecurity incident or whether it's disruption from natural disasters or equipment failure or weather events, um, you want to make sure that as an organization, you have a, a business continuity plan and disaster recovery process in place. So you're prepared in the event of any disruption that happens um, that could impact your organization. And again, if you need any help with, uh, you know, putting together a business continuity plan and recovery process, um, IRM can help you do that. Mobile and portable media. Um, so, you know, in today's environment, we have different, you know, models, uh, working models, hybrid, you know, models, you know, remote only models in terms of uh, employees and, and organizations. Um, so some organizations may decide to uh, have all employees use their own devices, right? Um, save on costs and say, okay, as an employee, just buy your own device. We may give you some, um, you know, some money towards it, but buy your own device, um, bring your own device to, uh, to do company business. And some companies may have policies to say, well, no, we don't want you to bring your own device. You have to use a company owned uh, equipment. Some companies may decide to have a hybrid model where they will allow you to bring your own device and also give you the option to use a company's uh, own device. Whatever model that your organization decides to utilize, uh, whether it's bring your own device or use company owned device, you're gonna need some kind of policy in place, right? So make sure that if you have decided to uh, go down the avenue of bring your own device, uh, make sure you have a policy in place that employees understand that if, if you're gonna allow them to bring their own device and use their own personal devices for company business, there are certain rules there that they have to follow, right? Um, so it's very important to have a BYOD policy in place. And also, you know, they're using their mobile devices to, to uh, perform company activities, um, do the day-to-day -day jobs, make sure you have a mobile security policy in place uh, to protect your data. And again, if you need any help developing these policies, IRM is help here to help you as well. Now your network defenses, um, you know, some organizations may have an internal network. Um, some organizations may just go straight to the cloud without having any internal network. Um, either way, uh, you have to, you know, protect your network defenses. Um, so use firewalls, um, make sure you're using a DNS firewall instead of a normal firewall. And a DNS firewall basically allows you to filter which websites and domains that your organization can access. So, you know, essentially you're blocking your employees from accessing, for example, porn sites as an example, right? So DNS filter is very important, you know, basically allows you to control um, where your network traffic would and would not go. Also ensure that you implement a, a virtual private network gateway uh, with two-factor authentication. So if you're an organization that allows employees to remote into your internal network, make sure that they are remoting in using a, a virtual private network, uh, which, is, which is a secure channel into your network environment, and make sure that you know, any remote access has two-factor uh, two authentication enabled. And your company Wi-Fi as well. Small organizations have Wi-Fi networks. Uh, if you are a company that you know, has a Wi-Fi network, make sure that you're using secure protocols like WPA2 and WPA3. From an email perspective, um, a recommendation is to implement uh, a, a kind of a mechanism called DMAC. And what DMAC does is basically, it, it basically protects you from a malicious email. So, you know, uh, we all use like Google email, you know, Microsoft email. Uh, Microsoft's not gonna, you know, in, you know, implement DMAC for you. you know, it's gonna be up to yourself to do that. So. We recommend implementing DMAC. It's more of a configuration. It's not a software, it's free. So you essentially you configure your email services and your Exchange server or your Google email to use DMAC. And that really helps protect from fraudulent email, it helps protect phishing, getting into your inboxes and so on and so forth, right? So that's what we recommend uh, as, a, as a way to protect your network. Um, so last three, baseline controls for Cyber Secure Canada. Uh, secure cloud and outsource IT services. So a lot of organizations typically will rely on an IT service provider to provide them with services. 
uh, if you are utilizing an IT service provider, make sure you do your due diligence, uh, make sure you do some kind of a, a due, dil due diligence security checklist uh, on that vendor or that service provider. Um, check that they have privacy and data handling policies in place, right? Um, check to ensure that they have a notification process uh, for data breaches. Um, you want to check also to ensure that they have a data destruction process. So at the end of your outsourcing contract, you want to understand, well, what are you going to do with my data and how are you going to destroy my data? So you want that assurance that, um, you know, your data is going to be destroyed uh, appropriately. And again, also, you know, where are they storing your data? Where's the physical location that these service providers are storing your data? Uh, I know today, because things are very global, uh, we're using the cloud environment, uh, your data can be stored anywhere, right? Um, and if you're, you're a business that needs to comply with certain regulations, uh, you need, really need to be mindful of where your data is being stored. So, because I know certain regulations and laws uh, always require that data is held in, in Canada and nowhere else. And, uh, you know, the U.S. has certain rules as, as well, certain regulations in the U.S., is like, do not take out your data outside the U.S. It has to stay in the U.S. You can utilize a service provider outside the U.S., but make sure your data is in the U.S. And the same applies for certain regulations in Canada as well. They always require that the data stays in the country in this um, in Canada. So always ask your service provider, where, where, where's the physical location of my data? Where are you storing my data? Where's the data center which my data is being stored? Okay. Um, Secure websites and applications. So if you're an organization or a business that develops uh, websites or you, you develop web applications uh, to sell your products, um, you know, make sure that you follow, you know, guidelines for building secure uh, web applications. So the Open Web Application Security Project called OWASP is a standard that's used by many development communities uh, to ensure that they're building secure applications. And also the application security verification standard, that's another standard uh, you need to uh, look into uh, if you're developers, if you're an organization that has developers building web applications for you. Always perform annual, uh, annual penetration testing on your web applications. So if you're a small business, a starter, startup building uh, a web application product, don't release this product into the world and then decide, oh, I'll pen test it later. You know, that's not a, a very good approach, right? Always make sure you pen test your web applications before you release them. And uh, always make sure you have a process in place to perform annual penetration testing on your web applications. That's very important because um, what a pen test does is basically, acts, is basically simulating what a, a hacker is going to do, right? Um, so uh, it's very important to find flaws in your, your code before a hacker does it. And last but not least, employee awareness and training. Very important. Um, human error while using information systems remains an element of too many cybersecurity events, right? Uh, so make sure you train your employees on basic cybersecurity best practices, provide employees with annual cybersecurity training, and conduct monthly phishing campaigns if you can. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Um, this slide provides some useful resources and free tools uh, to help you keep your small business safe. Uh, so I mentioned Cyber Secure Canada. Uh, if you can go to that website, um, Cyber Secure Canada is the nation's cybersecurity certification program for small businesses. So make sure you go in there, read uh, about that. And if you do want to get yourself certified, and IRM can help you and guide you through that process. A uh, free vulnerability scanning tool. Um, There's a tool called Tenable IO. Uh, it gives you up to, uh, allows you to scan up to free, uh, it allows you to scan, scan free 10 devices in your environment. So, you know, if you're a small startup, you only have, you know, a handful of devices, you can utilize this tool uh, to scan for uh, any vulnerabilities you may have in the devices you, that you're utilizing. Websites and web applications. Um, if you have a website or you have a web application as an organization, you may want to look at the Qualys SSL Labs uh, software. This is a free online service that performs a deep analysis of the configuration of your web server and will tell you where all your vulnerabilities are or where things need to be um, addressed. Also, uh, Zap Proxy is another tool. It's a free open source uh, tool. 
uh, used for web application um, scanning. So uh, I know a lot of developments, uh, a lot of developers use this as they're building their, their products and building uh, their web applications. They would, they would run a tool like this to scan for vulnerabilities in the code and address those uh, before they actually release their product. So if you're an organization, you have a development shop, you may want to look at this, uh, this free tool. Uh, know before, uh, know before provides IT security tools. Um, these are free IT security tools you can uh, you can use for phishing tests, uh, provide security awareness, um, you know, uh, it provides email security tests and malware tests. Um, and know before is very well known to provide very good cyber security awareness training. And you know, the prices are very reasonable for smaller companies. So you may want to consider that as an option or uh, a way of providing your employees annual cybersecurity training. Barracuda is another free tool uh, for protecting and helping you um, protect your email. Um, so it's a free email threat scanner tool that inspects the emails in your organization to discover any potential threats that may be hiding in your employee's inbox. Uh, and last but not least, your endpoints. Um, so today, you know, in the past, you know, antivirus software, anti-malware software was pretty good, um, you know, but today we have ransomware to worry about. And I know a lot of these uh, software security companies have built ransomware protection in their antivirus software. So if you're going to be purchasing uh, antivirus software, always make sure that you are purchasing a license that includes ransomware protection because we're all at risk of, the, of this uh, threat. Okay, so last but not least, I guess um, that's it really from me. Um, if you need to learn more about how we can help you achieve Cyber, cyber Secure Canada certification, please feel free to contact IRM and we'll hold your hand and help you walk through that process to get you certified and keep your business safe. So thank you very much everyone for listening and Kelly, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, I'll just see if there are any any questions you provided a lot of really good um, information, very useful tips here. And, and most of it is, I'm going to say is simple, but what's yeah. kind of funny is not everybody follows these. So um, it, it, I think there, um, there's some really valuable resources here. Before we do go, does anybody have any questions? I think you answered everything, Victoria. <laughs> uh, yeah, wonderful job. And uh, we will send the recording out here. You'll have Victoria's information as well. You can see she's pretty knowledgeable. She'd be a great resource to help you implement anything that you needed. So thank you for taking the time to do this, Victoria. We really appreciate it. At the uh, same time, if anybody's interested in attending any of our peer groups, you can reach out to myself and um, we look forward to seeing you at future events. We're in